So I just wanted to introduce um, William Young, who's our next speaker this, uh, this morning. Um, William is a Queensland-born, Sydney-based artist, a third-generation Chinese um, descent. And um, I guess he introduces us to the China, uh, the China project through a, an Australian context. So I think it's a wonderful way to enter the exhibition and enter the gallery. Um, William's produced two new commissions for the China project. Um, the large work we see behind us on the wall here called Lifelines and the work in the foyer cabinet which you see behind you running along um, there which features um, 18 self-portraits and a series of personal objects. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to William Young. Thank you Russell. Um, yes, I, I was thrilled first of all to accept the commission from the Queensland Art Gallery. Um, it was a difficult commission in that this wall is really big and I hadn't really done anything probably that size. And the cabinet is kind of problematic in that it's a cabinet. And um, it, I don't think it was designed for showing work. So I think that someone told me that the architects put it in there as a kind of um, display for product, as a possible display for product. So it's always been a difficult space to actually put something in. And uh, I think that probably if you're going to use this space, then you have to sort of design, or design especially for this space. And the other thing about the cabinet was when Russell first told me about it, he said that oh, we want some objects for the cabinet. And I thought, oh, that'll be a bit of a problem. Uh, I don't really have anything to put in it. And over the, well, this was about a year ago, but over the past year, I've been thinking, I, it's been at the back of my mind, and suddenly I started pulling things out. And uh, I discovered that I had quite a lot of objects that relate to somehow China, China that I'd even forgotten about. And so it was quite funny. In fact, I just remembered one a few days ago. Oh, I should have put that in. But it, it could only fit certain things and it can't have anything too big because it's quite narrow. Now, I'd already done, for the big wall, I'd already sort of, I'd done a project in Germany um, or, or rather I was part of a project in G Germany. I went over to the city of Halle in um, Germany, former East Germany, for a festival. And they asked me if I'd like to participate with the local people and do a projection piece. It, it wasn't all, all my work. It, I was part of it uh, on existing buildings. Um, that, that's quite a common thing to do. Um, and uh, so I thought that I, I took faces of the people of Hala and just projected them on this um, building with large Xenon projectors. Um, so I have a great confidence in the human face. Uh, personally, I've written it in the book somewhere, that I think that it's the most interesting thing to look at. Uh, I love portraiture, and in fact, um, my own personal preference is just the human face simply presented. I mean, if you try... Um, people who... Oh, I won't go down that line. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I'll just say that my own taste is that I just prefer the, the human face, uh, simply presented. And uh, I can look at a good portrait for hours. I mean, I can just be intrigued. It's just one of those things that, that uh, I just find fascinating. So anyway, so um, then I decided that we that of course um, I should put up my blood relatives because I've been using them in my works over the past how many years? Um, 20 years, my performance pieces. And so I already had the photographs. And um, 
it was just a matter of toning them down uh, or editing them down so that there was a representative. In fact, I'd have quite liked, in my initial um, plan for this wall, I, I'd actually covered the whole wall um, so that, that they just covered from floor to ceiling. But it was deemed too expensive, so we scaled down the actual print size. Uh, but still, that's a pretty big size. I've never printed that big before. And it was slightly traumatic because I had to supervise the printing from Sydney. So there were always couriers running backwards and forwards and um, batches being lost. So it was, um, it, it was um, difficult. But we had a very good printer here in Brisbane, uh, Big Chief. So I'll give them a, I'll give them a plug. Um, and uh, David from Big Chiefs does a lot of work for the gallery and he was experienced in printing up Big and he, he had assurance and confidence whereas I was actually a bit worried. When, it, it is actually quite hard when you see just a fragment of, that, um, of one of those pieces, uh, a, a little test strip and you're seeing it quite close and you wonder how it will... It's very hard to actually visualise it uh, up big. But anyway, I'm very happy with the job that they did reproducing the photos. And also up there are uh, photographs of places because, as I said, my history is from North Queensland and they're all, pla they're all Chinese um, artefacts from the past which I've, um, from North Queensland. There's the Joss House at Atherton, right at the top, the Joss House at Innisfail, which is like a suburban Joss House. It's been blown down by a cyclone and they've rebuilt it in concrete block. Um, Joss House is like Chinese temple. Um, there's my Aunt Bessie's house, um, in Cairns, and that was family headquarters. And there's the shrine from the Cooktown and Cemetery, the Cooktown Cemetery, um, where it was from the Chinese section. And um, the inscription on the shrine says, "Regard as if present," and I, I quite like that as a kind of um, thing to think about the dead. Okay, so I've, I've probably said enough about this um, big wall. And um, the smaller wall, the smaller cabinet, has got 18 self-portraits. Now, since I do performance pieces, I talk quite a lot about myself. And so I've always got, I've usually got a story which I can then find an image to fit the story. And of course, none of those photographs I took because they're self because they're all of me. So um, th there's a certain irony in that. Uh, but anyway, um, I, I distinguish that some of them were photographs that were of me that people had taken and I just used them. And I credited that with as photographed by Charlie Young or photographed by Melanie Cooper. But there are others the photograph of me and um, so in, in some sense that they're my photographs uh, and I've said assisted by Ivo Claridge or assisted by Alan Young or something like that. So they're the images themselves and they all tell a story. Um, they're, they're, um, I've got more in the self-portrait series but these <coughs> pertain to a kind of Chinese identity or search for identity. And the other thing about them is some of them are actually, we reduced quite a number of them because um, they're not really at the scale that, that if they were in a gallery, some of them would be much larger. That one of me and the, the cane fields, for example, uh, which is a very important one piece, um, it's where I was investigating my uncle William Fang Nguyen's murder and I stood in the place where my uncle had been shot and so that, that was, that's a very important moment in my 
research of um, the Chinese history, my own sense of uh, family trauma um, that happened to the family when my uncle was murdered in 1922. And that was the, the one, that's really, that's really a big print, but it's quite a small print in the cabinet. And um, I, I, that was the sort of start of the self-portrait self series. Um, I called it um, self-portrait number one. And I've sort of, they're all, they all could be self-portrait, could be titled self-portrait up to number 18. But I've randomly given them um, numbers as I've done them. So um, that's the thing. And that they all relate to a certain part of my life um, where um, I developed into this, or well, I was this kind of person at that time, um, from childhood really. And the objects, um, I suppose that they're the most interesting part of the exhibition for me because, you know, I know uh, I've sort of been dealing with photographs, but then it's making objects work. And the way that I've presented them, there's a sheet there where you can actually read what each object is. And they're kind of, um, each piece there has a kind of meaning in my life. So I feel with my art, and to a large extent when I write on photographs, this same process happens, where I give life to the object and to the photograph by placing it in a narrative of my own life and say, this is my own personal meaning to this object or to this photograph. And that has worked for me um, because people can engage with my work uh, because of this text, this story, this narrative continuum. And so um, lots of people tell me that they like uh, looking at my work and I've seen people actually engaging with that cabinet um, which um, th they've spent quite a lot of time there reading the stories and that sort of vindicates what I'd hoped that people could engage with it and the kind of objects they're, they're not many of them are precious objects um, or what you might even expect to see in a gallery. But, for example, there's a plate from, that from my mother, you know, we used to eat whatever from it every day when we used to live in Dimbula. And when my mother died, there are only two things that I took, really. Um, there, were, there, were, there, there were two plates and two paintings or works. They were the only things that I took. Um, my brother said to me, is there anything you want? And I said, yes, I'll have this plate and this plate and these two paintings. There's, there's nothing else that I wanted. And so that plate is there and um, it probably even takes on a different meaning when it's in a gallery and you can look at it because it's just quite an old plate. But it's a kitchen plate. It doesn't have any value, but it's, it's worn and it's got a few cracks in it and um, it, it kind of tells a story. It's got character. And I've got other plates um, that I've collected later. But um, that, that's the kind of thing that um, um, I, I'm happy to show in, in the objects. Now, I'll point out a few objects which I think are quite interesting objects. One of them is um, a set of eggs. Um, it's, um, it's like the third, under the third um, um, per, um, painting there. Now, I've got a friend in Sydney called Aaron Seto, and uh, he sort of discovered, he, he didn't discover it, he researched this process, and he was able to do fat photographic prints on salted duck eggs that he bought in Chinatown. And so, so their actual, I, we did a swap actually. Um, I gave him a print of my no Chinese flag and 
he um, did this set of duck eggs, of, uh, seven duck eggs, which has got my family on it. It's my paternal grandfather, my maternal grandmother, my mother, my father, my sister, my brother and I. So um, I, I'm just um, very happy with that work because of the eggs and um, it, it's, uh, it, it, it is about family. And he's given it the title, this is his title, The 1000 Other Things, Dash Bloodlings. So that's one piece, that, that's like a work of art. Um, a, another piece is um, a fragment of tile from the Temple of Heaven in China. Um, I don't know if you know the Temple of Heaven, but it's a magnificent structure in Beijing. And uh, it's one of my favorite places in, in um, Beijing or in China. And it, it represents a kind of spiritual dimension to China, um, where here the emperor would come each year, he'd perform rituals where he would ritually converse with the gods and he would um, spend two nights there um, doing all these rituals. Now, in just lying by the side of the gutter at the Temple of Heaven, there was a little piece of broken tile. It's got distinctive blue tiles. And so I picked that up and I just brought it home. And uh, it's like a fragment. It's like the classic souvenir where you have something that reminds you of something else. And so that's my little piece of heaven I write in my, my thing. But it does have that significance like that represents spiritual China, a, a cultural um, spirituality, that little fragment of time. And um, there's also a piece that I bought in Sydney, which is um, a little um, piece of miniature calligraphy. It's on a piece of ivory, which is about the size of my um, little finger's nail. So it's very small, and there's over 100 characters written on this little piece of ivory. It was difficult to show. In fact, I think that there probably could have been a better solution of showing it if we got a microscope specialist to actually arrange a series of lens, lenses. But as it is, we've got a, 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 it's slightly magnified, but there's a photograph of the text beside the thing. And um, it's, sort of, it's sort of miniature. It's the other end of the micro scale. And um, it's a Buddhist text. It's the Heart Sutra. And um, that's, um, that's like the, the text. It's the brand of Buddhism that traveled from India and went to um, China and Japan. And the Heart Sutra is about emptiness, and it, the text is like the philosophy of finding enlightenment through uh, emptiness. And so that's all on that little tiny um, miniaturized tablet, and that's, that's my favorite um, piece. And, but you have to look at it, and I have to tell people about it to, to draw their attention to it. But also, I'm actually thrilled that to show that at this exhibition because that piece languished on my table and um, probably only about four people had seen it. And so now it has a chance to be seen by a wider audience. So um, it's now five to 12 um, and um, I could just ramble on but maybe pe people would like to ask some questions. Yes. Yes. It used to be. Oh, okay. Um, someone just asked me about the house in Cairns, wanting to know what street it was. Um, it was in Lake Street, Cairns. It's been demolished now. It belonged to my Aunt Bessie. My Aunt Bessie was like the matriarch of the family. Um, she was the. Um, widow of my murdered uncle William Fang Yuen and she moved from Innisfail to Cairns. 
she bought this house. And that house was always family headquarters for our family. And I can remember we lived in Dimbula. We'd come down to Dimbula. It'd take half a day to drive there. It takes about an hour and a half nowadays. And we'd, um, I just remember vividly that house. So I could describe the living room. And um, it, it's probably, it, it seemed very large to me, but I think that places when you were a, were a child seem larger than they actually were in your memory. And so that house is sort of symbolic of family headquarters. Yes? I wonder how the language has survived in your family, Chinese language. Uh, a question here, how has the Chinese language survived in your family? The language was lost. Um, partly because my father, his clan were the Hakka, and he spoke Hakka, and my mother's clan were the Siya. That's the most common clan that came to Australia, and in fact the world, in the migration in the late, um, in the 19th century. Siya are all over the world. Um, and so my mother spoke Cantonese, so English was their common language and that was what they, we spoke at home. But my mother could have taught us Cantonese as it was usually left up to her to do this sort of thing. But she never did because she thought that being Chinese was a complete liability and that really it would be better if we tried to be Australian. And that's how I was brought up. But I can't really go on blaming my mother all my life for not teaching me Chinese. I've tried to learn it twice, but it's a difficult language because it's tonal. And um, um, I, I just, uh, I, have trouble le I have trouble with languages in general. And so I studied it for a while, but I went over to China and when I practiced it, nobody could understand a word I said. <laughs> And I found that so disheartening that I just gave up. But the thing is, coming back to your question about languages, there are at least four of my relatives, including my brother, my auntie Audrey, and my uncle Ray, who in our late age have tried to like um, learn Chinese. I've tried to learn Mandarin, and they've tried to learn Cantonese, which is more, more difficult and they didn't have any success. Yet, with the younger generation, the people who are like 20 or so now, they've learned Mandarin at school, and at least four of them have been living and working in China. So that's the generational thing about it. But you see, when I grew up in the 50s, um, we weren't encouraged to talk um, one's own traditional language. Um, the general tone of things was speak English, be Australian. So, so that sort of thing was frowned about on at, at that time. And also, there were edicts put out to mothers saying, don't talk to your children in your um, own language because it'll confuse them. That was the kind of official um, edict. Yes, hello. Oh, the, ble the bell. A question here, where's that bell? That bell is at the Atherton Joss House and it was taken, th that's right up the top. Um, when I took that photograph of the bell, the, um, the Joss House was closed, no one was looking up, it was in a state of disrepair. The last um, person who, um, believed in the Joss House was John Fongon's, an Atherton person's mother. And she used, she was the last person who actually used the Joss House as a, as a place of worship. And when she died, then really the Joss House died with her because there was no one to believe in it. And so it was in a state of languishment um, when I took that photograph because there were, there were cobwebs all over the place. But recently, in the past 10 years, they've actually um, refurbished the Atherton Historic Society, have, or whatever, 
they've refurbished the Joss House and it's now like a well-kept um, heritage building. And just personally, I think it's one, of, that's my favourite. I've travelled around Australia looking for this I'll just have the project anyway. But anyway, that's my favourite building um, in all, of all the Chinese artefacts in Australia because of the corrugated iron. It's kind of delicate, I think, like the way that they've used the corrugated iron. And uh, it's very Australian. Of course, they, that's not a traditional material, but it's like one of those hybrid transplants. Of, the design is Chinese, but the materials are Australian. And since we've... Oh, we're back. We're back. But um, we'll, we'll, it's 12 o'clock, so maybe we'll end it here.